Hi there, this is Self Critical Automaton, and this is part two of chapter two of Bayonetta. So, yep, we're just picking up right in the middle of the chapter where we left off. I think... nope, no, I didn't miss something after all. I have in fact remembered correctly, which is always the best way to remember things. It's also good to just keep smashing stuff as you go through to just absolutely confuse all of the ordinary people who are watching things smash for no reason. It is weird that everything seems to exist in multiple places simultaneously, but um, I don't know, it's a cool little detail. The actual restrictions on what does and does not have like physical interaction with someone who's in Purgatorio is kind of confusing to me. It's not ever clearly explained. Sometimes she walks through people, sometimes she touches people. In the rigorous pursuit that is the magical arts, one method is said to have caused countless deaths during training. Witch Walk. To the Umbra Witches, it seems Witch Walk was truly indispensable. Taking their power from the moon, this band of witches were able to draw on the power-enriching qualities of moonlight to execute high-level techniques. However, records state that Witch Walk was powered by a pact with a particularly powerful demon, who would grant the power to break gravity's bonds, and not by the more common moonlight source. As no further records remain as to the nature of this technique, any more hard facts remain unknown. However, by looking at the traces left on the buildings around Vigrid, one can make some further assumptions. The traces are, in fact, footprints left on the surfaces of the wall. They blend into the city so well you almost never catch a glimpse of them at first glance. In fact, those without knowledge of which walk will probably never notice the footprint's presence. Amongst the dirt and scars on the surface, there are many buildings in Vigrid where footprints sporadically continue along their sides. <clears throat> this must be none other than proof that these magic practitioners were able to literally walk on walls. Many of these buildings where the witches have left their mark are truly strange. There are doors in unbelievably high locations, or the building may lack a path to its entrance entirely. Rejecting all intruders and living a life of solitude, witch walk was not just a training technique, it was a shield that protected the way their way of life. I mean, that's kind of a reach. You can't just assume that because there's footsteps on a wall, people could walk on walls. And reading that, I do kind of wonder, are there any walls in this area where you can see the footprints, because that would be a really neat little, um, I don't know what you'd call it, a really neat little detail to have in the in the environment. But um, yeah, alas, I have never noticed them, which possibly is just because I don't believe in witches. So these two chests just only have upgrade materials in them, which is unfortunate because, you know, I'd rather have something more useful. But time to fight two things, so there should be a bunch more of these horrible wheel guys that I hate, and I think they stick- I've never seen those stick to the walls before actually. So I guess that's something else they can do. Um, but yeah, so this isn't an especially difficult fight, but I haven't been upgrading my health very much. I've been relying on the um, things I find in the levels rather than actually just Spending rings to get some health upgrades. I think I will probably do that soon. Especially since I'm getting dangerously low health here. In fact, I'm actually going to use an item. I don't know if the different items have different, you know, um, penalty weights at the end of a level when they give you your uh, assessment. Oh, okay. I've not seen that attack before. Interesting. That's a new animation. So... Yeah, these guys aren't normally this tough. I'm not sure why I'm having so much difficulty. I should stop making excuses for myself and just get to it. So, yeah, this is the same guy who we fought earlier in the level. He's come back. And um, when he hits a low percentage of health, he summons another one of him. Which is the upgraded version. Most of the enemies in this game do have upgraded versions that you fight as you go through. Some of them are actually different enemies with different... Um, entries in the, you know, Pokedex of Angels, but... Oh, that was an inconvenient camera angle change. Anyway, it's usually best just to focus on one first and make sure it's destroyed, because as uh, Sun Tzu once said, focus on one enemy until he is destroyed, then you have completed battle. That is my only Sun Tzu quote that I know. Um, don't expect me to be referencing the classics, because I do not know any of them. But yeah, so... The bigger the enemy, the more powerful the weapon drops for the most part. These guys, as you can see, drop incredibly powerful battle axes. I swear she says avocado.
I don't know if we get a good look at him here, but I do want to point out that he has that weird little human head poking up out of the top of his normal head. I think the, um, oh, that's right. Last episode I was talking about whether or not the angel designs are interesting or weird. I do think it's interesting that the angel designs themselves are kind of generic for the most part, but then some of them have clearly been influenced by, um, by folklore. And yet, what has and hasn't been influenced by folklore is kind of completely arbitrary. Why do they reference the Ophanim, but then not call them Ophanim? Why do they call them whatever it was they called them instead? Uh, but then they also do kind of reference the common misconception. Oh, by the way, you can do this. I forgot to... I was going to do that in the fight. I was going to just smash those big guys like that, but I completely forgot. So, yeah, uh, the Ophanim and stuff. So... The narrative kind of implicitly references the fact that archangels are actually pretty low in the angelic hierarchy. In pop culture, people think archangels are the biggest, most powerful angels, but they're not. They're quite low level. They're just the, the higher, higher tier of the weakest angels. So, um, yeah, it's interesting that they reference that by having the archangels be the second weakest enemies in the game, or at least the second weakest type of the common enemies. Um, but then other stuff is completely scattershot or random or it's it's kind of just grabbing at random without making much of a consistency. Anyway. Witches were ones of talent. That is my impression after years of exhaustive research into the Umbra. The word witches triggers within us all prejudices towards the paranormal or the supernatural. However, in this ancient city of Vigrid, the mechanical the magical arts were a systematic form of scholarship. Of course, what I have learned about witches will be labelled as fraud by the world at large, or undoubtedly dismissed as nonsense. Isn't it interesting that he says the word witch triggers prejudices towards the paranormal or the supernatural, and then goes on to say that the study of magic existed? It's still paranormal or supernatural, just because it's systematised doesn't make it not, like, those things. I will begin these notes with the items I have confirmed to be absolute facts with regards to witches. Due to their lack of contact with the outside world, we often feel that witches were a strictly hereditary order. However, this was not always the case. For one to become a witch, one must first and foremost possess incredible spirit energy. Those with this power could become witches despite being a low birth, and those without this power would be forced into secular life, regardless of any blood ties to a witch clan. Naturally, children born within a clan were often quick to grasp the concept of magic due to the environment around them, allowing their innate abilities to bloom at a much earlier age. Coming to grips with this con concept must have inspired one to further hone their spinet spirit energy. These children were also able to participate in extensive drills with other witches, and only those who had shown great promise and achievement were able to take their witchly vows prior to passage into womanhood. The exact nature of spirit energy remains unclear, although recognising its existence within oneself and refining this talent further was the one true path to produce a witch of great ability. Based on this sort of thing, I find myself wondering, are all the witches male and all of the sages... Wait, no, hang on. Got that backwards. Is this is this a gendery thing, is what I'm saying? Um, because I will have commentary later on in this Let's Play about how camp this game is, but also how clearly influenced by a straight person's conception of what camp is. Because the design team were, as far as I know, mostly straight and mostly male, and the, directors, the director of this game is, as far as I know, a straight man. Uh, just a little environmental detail, that's where we'll be going in a couple levels time. There was a mention earlier of a mysterious structure on the cliffs, so it's nice that you can see the other levels you'll go to later. Um, time to just dip into the shop and visit our good good friend Radar. Yeah. Another LP? <laughs> Working me to the bone, but no need to pity me. I was bored anyways. Let me go whip some things into shape for you. Yeah, that's definitely a different song. So each of these cutscenes, there's a unique one for each different uh, weapon that you unlock. And it does play a different song each time. I, but I still don't know if these are actual musical pieces. I think it's also worth noting... Oh, hang on, he's coming back, isn't he? And... There he is. Took a bit to pound into shape, but the workmanship's solid. Now, go put this thing to good use. I actually really like the detail on him in this cutscene. I like that he comes back out of hell, spattered in blood, and literally smoking. 
there's kind of like a fierce joy to his character design and animations. He's very reserved all of the time, but then he goes to kick the absolute shit out of some demons and he comes back with a kind of like heavily suppressed but just noticeable like manic happiness to him. So I am wondering at this point, who is he? He's not a witch, right? Because as far as we know, there aren't any male witches. And he's definitely not a sage because he's associated with hell. Is he a demon who's living on Earth? Is that allowed? It seems like angels can't live on Earth, so what's the difference? These answers, I assume, will be ans- These questions, I assume, will be answered at some point in the narrative. But you never know. Perhaps he's just a mystery. Um, I don't want to spend any on any of these. There still aren't any good new techniques that I want to buy. And... None of these are available yet either. So the question is, do I want to buy a health upgrade? Or a magic upgrade? Or do I want to keep saving and try and get one of these items? These are all um, usable upgrade items, some of which are like passive bo passive things that, that just alter your existing abilities and some give you new abilities. If I'm going to use one of these, it might be Celine's Light, which is very useful. Essentially, it stops you having to know how to dodge. And if you have any any magic power, then when you get hit, it automatically does a perfect dodge for you. Um, or at least I think that's how it works. But it might be worth saving up for this more expensive one, which turns your uh, dodge into a counterattack. Um, or oh, hang on, no, sorry, it lets you counterattack instead of dodging. That seems difficult, and I'm reluctant to spend 200,000 rings on that when I have less than 100,000. It just seems like it'll be... Like, unlike the new techniques, which you can try out before you buy, I don't know how easy that one will be to pull off, and I would hate to spend all that money on something that I then am unable to use, because um, I'm kind of a scrub. Oh, I was going to talk about Rodan himself. He's actually one of my favourite characters in this game. I really like his attitude, I really like his character design. Um, much like Bayonetta herself, he is clearly gay. Um... Despite the fact that there's no... Well, I mean, if he's some kind of extra-dimensional entity, maybe he's just kind of ace. But who knows? It doesn't matter. It's not referenced in any way, ever. So this is the first um, unlockable melee weapon. Instead of having guns, you can have a melee weapon in hand. You can only equip them... Well, actually, no. Every weapon has different equipable slots. The, uh, the sword can only be equipped to your hands, though. Which makes sense, because who would put swords on their feet? That's ridiculous. Guns! Guns on your feet. That makes sense. Oof. I genuinely thought I would dodge that, and I just completely did not. So, the um, Shiraba sword has about the same moveset as the uh, basic um, four guns that you can have, but instead of some of your... Like, it has the same moveset, but some of the animations are different, and you don't have giant fists, you have a sword. This is also very smashable. Oh hey, I've got platinum even though I got um, completely smashed. I really like the animation for when you're at low health. The kind of reaching hands of of hell trying to drag you back down. It's um, It does genuinely contribute a sense of urgency. So I'm actually going to run all the way back. As I have said before, this game has a lot of backtracking and it's kind of tedious. I, um, I do not enjoy games that rely on backtracking for finding their secrets. It is just irritating because, for well, for all the reasons I said previously. So, oh yeah, I was going to talk about Rodan. Rodan is a reference to the, um, you know, muchly beloved sculptor who is basically the father of modern sculpture. Um, and um, even his, uh, even the character Rodan, is, his bar is called the Gates of Hell, which is a reference to one of Rodin's most famous works, which was an enormous gateway to hell, presumably. I think it's all the way back here where I'm going. Ah, uh, there it is. Now, I should be able to beat this one, but it might take a few tries, so I'm going to stop talking in a minute, but yeah. Why is, why is Rodin named that? Why is he a reference to a famous sculptor? I don't know. Why is this architecture based on the work of Gaudi? I don't know. Usually reference is used to kind of imply something thematic or make some kind of allusion, but the references in this game seem to be completely arbitrary and just thrown in scattershot. 
So after that incredibly clumsy edit, as I'm sure you can uh, guess, we're going into me dubbing over the top afterwards. Uh, so yeah, the parameters of this challenge is that you can only... Oh, no, sorry, is that you need to uh, get torture attack finishers on them. Which, um, the difficulties of that are actually slightly more subtle than you would expect. There is no, um, you know, there's no direct limitation on your abilities. You can do everything you can do normally. But, uh, in this, functionally, the enemies you're fighting become a resource. You have to get six torture attacks, and you have, what, 10 to 15 enemies in order to achieve that. The way you earn torture attacks is by damaging your enemies. Therefore, it's actually quite easy to accidentally kill all of them before you've managed to get six torture attack finishers off successfully. Additionally, you can only be hit three times, but, you know, that's a parameter that is present for almost all of these. So, you do learn to manipulate it in certain ways. For example, in this particular kind of challenge, it is to your advantage to uh, farm up magical power on the big tough enemies and then use that to trigger torture attacks on the weaker enemies, as you can see right here. Additionally, you might notice I switched away from using the uh, Shiraba sword and back to the Scarborough Fair handguns as the weapon for this. That's because the Scarborough Fair handguns, their combos are pretty weak. Combos are what generate you magic power, magic power is what you need in order to do torture attacks. Therefore, if you're using the Shiraba, you're more likely to kill things before you get enough magical power to do a torture attack at all. I was pretty tense here, actually, because, as you can see, I only had one hit left. But this is, in fact, my successful attempt. Also, this being primarily combo-based means that I get another huge, huge combo multiplayer go going. Um, and, uh, yeah, this took several attempts, so I have, in fact, earned a huge amount of rings by doing this. I think I, uh, I, think I took three tries. This is the third try. Um, and as you can see, the time is getting pretty close, because that is the other, like... Actually, there's two other main difficulties with this one. In addition to the fact that you might accidentally kill everybody, there is also the fact that the time is quite tight, so you probably run out of time. And in fact, one of my attempts was because I did get all six torture attacks, but the final torture attack was still animating while the counter ticked down to zero. Which, <laughs> let me tell you, was kind of infuriating. Because you don't just need to defeat them all, you need to actually kill them all, not just get the six torture attacks. Ah, I didn't even talk about the thing I was going to talk about. So that one's really tough for the reasons I will have just explained, but um, that took me a few tries, two or three tries. Um, fortunately, we can now move on and jump straight back into the real world. I'm probably going to use a healing item because I think there is one combat left in this level. Uh, not counting the one I have skipped, of course, the um, bonus combat that I skipped. So I'm just going to use that many, I think. Oops. Ugh. Okay, there we go. So it's odd that it, it's kind of fun that it makes you do the little mini game to do that, even though Oh, actually, I have two red-hot shots. I could have safely died, because um, a red-hot shot is still a lot less than the penalty for death, and I could have saved some materials. Uh, oh well. Anyway, from here is basically just running back to where we were, and then there is a long cutscene and then a cool boss fight. Not to, you know, spoil you or anything. By the way, I don't think I've mentioned this, but this game has a dedicated voguing button, so... As I said, this game is incredibly camp, and um, hopefully I will get a chance to talk about uh, how interesting it is that it is as camp as it is, given the history of camp and the fact that it was made by a straight design team for the most part, as far as I know. Um, but yeah, so that is... <sighs> like, there's just a lot, you know? There's a lot going on there. God, there's a lot to talk about in this game, and I still haven't... Uh, I forgot to do the thing. So yeah, this is another one of those instances where if you smash it open, it just rebuilds itself too fast, which is why we needed these crystal statues to be rebuilt. Having had them rebuilt, we can then go sprinting all the way over here. Also notice the black cat. There was kind of a black cat reference um, in the Luca cutscene, which I was going to touch on but didn't. 
because everything in this is referential. But um, a black cat walks past behind him and then something almost falls on him. You know, just a fun little reference to the beliefs about bad luck and black cats. And I mean, Bayonetta already has like a whole black cat motif going on, even though, as you might notice, her shadow has butterfly wings. This is, um, she has a consistent butterfly motif, which you probably have noticed. It's on her glasses, it's on flashback hers mask that she wears. It's there when you do double jump. So you may also have noticed that Jean has a moth motif. So I assume that that's supposed to say different things about them thematically. Perhaps butterflies being inherently somewhat dark and moths being drawn to the light, but... Pointing guns at children, that's what heroes do. What are you doing running around Vigrid? You're certainly not dressed in your Sunday best. There's that late motif again. Hey, it's that guy. So this is the next boss fight, and it's not especially difficult unless you're me and keep forgetting to dodge this guy. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting set piece, and there's a lot of really fun, unique set pieces in this game. It repeats a lot of things in a lot of places, you know, the enemies are the same throughout the game, or just keep introducing new ones, I guess. Oh god, I'm really bad at about not getting hit by this guy. Which is doubly unfair considering he has such an obvious telegraph for all of his attacks. Partly it's that the, um, just the screen in this scene is so tightly confined. It's really quite hard to time your dodges and stuff because, well, you're in a tiny room with a giant dragon head. Um, also I did forget to switch back to my good good stabby sword attacks. But, um, yeah, no, sorry, I was talking about butterflies and moths, and I gotta say, moths are kind of also associated with darkness. Moths go around at night, they fly towards the moon, and the moon is definitely a recurring motif in this. Um, but maybe there's something to be said about moths being drawn to the light, whereas butterflies kind of just do their own thing. Butterflies don't give a fuck. Which, I guess, also fits their two respective characters. Oh wow, stone on damage, that's terrible. So yeah, that's the end of chapter two. Um, I guess I did manage to get through without dying, that's good. I'll take a gold trophy on uh, live commentary. So, yep, just the minigame to go. So... I don't know what's up with this game's kind of re recurring references to Sonic the Hedgehog, but in the opening cutscenes there was all of that talk about Eggman, and occasionally you can catch little bits of Sonic, like Sonic the Hedgehog game music in the background. In this minigame, only for the first couple of seconds, while it's 
you know, um, swinging around so that you can look down the barrel of the gun. Um, during that moment, you can hear a tiny little bit of one of the OSTs for the Sonic the Hedgehog games, the old 2D ones. Why? I don't know. But yeah, it's the gold rings from Sonic the Hedgehog. There's a character called Eggman. There's the music. It's it's very strange. This whole dream is kind of like a... This whole game is kind of like a fever dream. But uh, yeah, so... I want to dip into the shop, but first I'm going to say what I was going to say before, and then forgot. Namely that... There are a lot of elements set up in this game that so far seem to have been abandoned. For instance, um, the first chapter opens with a debriefing that tells you about a bunch of stuff it sounds like you're about to do, and then the entire rest of the mission, and the subsequent second mission as well, is just completely unrelated. Um, you know, I'm supposed to be stealing a gem from some rich guy. Uh, that's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is running around fighting my lesbian crush in flashbacks. Um, so, yeah, let's just jump to the gates of hell real quick. Hey, check this out. What are you buying? <laughs> Heard that in a game once. Like I said, a lot of these little intros are references to other games, and that is, naturally, a Resident Evil 4 reference. Go check out my Resident Evil 4 Let's Play, it's pretty good. Um, anyway, I was talking about abandoned elements. So it has that whole kind of... Um, debriefing from a secondary character over the intro cutscene, and I genuinely thought that was going to be a recurring element, setting up what you would be doing in each mission, but no. The subsequent chapters just throw you straight in. It's all um, a, a direct sequence of events with no real gaps between them. But uh, why am I here? Because I want to buy an accessory. What accessory do I want? I don't know. I should probably try and get all of them, but... Um... So these are actually neat little bits of um, lore, actually. I might as well read them out. Sergei's Lover. Made by Amatriona, a witch from the Principality of Moscow, this brace allows the user to call upon the strength of the demon to which they are contracted and divide themselves into multiple beings. So, uh, by using this treasured item, Matriona was able to face several foes at once during battle. Her exploits have recently come back into vogue, leading her to become the model for the Russian Matryoshka folk dolls. Is that, is that actual folklore? I have no idea. So that one lets you split into multiple people, anime style. The Inferno... I'm just going to give you the overview of these, actually. I can't be bothered to read them all out. Um, it's neat that all of these reference witches from all over the world. It kind of implied that witches only exist solely in this one place, and that this was where, you know, the Umbra witches existed. But this reference is a Russian witch. This doesn't reference any real-world location. This one just summons allies to help you. This one... Um, is an activable thing that then uh, gives you a damage shield which protects you for a little bit and it references Lahasa which I think is in Tibet maybe? Someone told me but I don't remember. I should have looked it up that would have been clever wouldn't it? So that's a witch from there. This is a witch from Egypt because it is because apparently Cleopatra was a witch who knew? Um, certainly not me. My girlfriend is raising her hand in the background just pointing out that she knew apparently that Cleopatra was a witch. Um, this references the American Navajo. Um, please forgive me for my pronunciation. I'm I'm bad at that. So this is and this is uh, Japan, and then this one references um, I guess just Africa. It's there's kind of a problem there. There's a problem in a lot of media of conflating all of different parts of Africa and just saying Africa is is Africa. You know, there's not different nations. Really, this should be referencing as Especially since later it references a Malinese witch, you know, you'd think that it would not just say an African goddess, because what does that mean? There's tons of different religious traditions from different parts of Africa, because it's, you know, a big place with a lot of different people. Um, and finally, the moon of Mahakala is referencing uh, India. So each of these reference different places. Some of them are useful, some of them are not. I might get this one later and see if I can do the counterattacks. I might get this one... Um, Actually, I have no idea what that one's for. This one lets you stun people. They, they do all sorts of different things, but that's not quite relevant right now. Uh, I think I won't buy any of them. I think I'm actually going to grab a one of each of these for now. I'm going to get a health increase, and I'm going to get a magic increase. Could get another one, but I'm not going to. 
So yeah, it's always lovely to see our friend Rodan. I actually think the Gates of Hell, if Vigrid, and especially the train station Vigrid, is supposed to be the closest Earth gets to divinity, and therefore that's what the divine architecture looks like in real life, which seems to be what they're implying in some of the text logs previously, then logically a place that's very close to hell, i.e. where a guy who's in t who's related to hell in some way lives and works, might have hellish architecture. So that kind of H.R. Geiger inspired effect for the, uh, the shop is probably what hell looks like. That is my guess. Anyway, that is going to be all from me for today. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching. It's going to be really hard for me to spin bullshit if I have you going, what the fuck does that mean in the background? <laughs>